Welcome everyone to the data visualization and analysis of time series data using Surfer webinar. Hi, my name is Drew and I will be your presenter for today's webinar. So we've got a great presentation for everyone today where we're going to delve into using Surfer in an alternative way by showing you some of the projects that Dr. Rick Kaler, who is one of our power users and our guest host, created using some GIS-based raster techniques to display and analyze time series hydrology data in Surfer. Now, of course, I always like to start out our presentations by giving you a little bit of background uh, about our, uh, myself and our guest host. So I'll go ahead and start with myself. Uh, I'm now working in my 11th year uh, here at Golden Software, where I am currently the product manager for both Digger and Voxler. And I also work as the training coordinator for all of our apps uh, for about the past two and a half years. I attended the University of Kansas and Metropolitan State University of Denver, where I graduated with a BS in land use and GIS. I would also like to introduce you to Dr. Rick Kaler, who is the founder, owner, and CEO of Visual Data Analytics and who is also the innovator of the data visualization techniques on the projects that we're gonna be discussing today. Um, so I'd like to give you a little bit more background uh, on Rick. So Dr. Rick Kaler has his PhD in watershed management with a minor in remote sensing and image analysis. Uh, and this was from the University of Arizona. Whereas disser dissertation research addressed big data in water resources, where his work focused on raster base analysis and visualization of hydrologic uh, time series data. Okay. He also has um, vast experience in water resources, which goes back 30 years, including being the director of water resources for an environmental consulting company. And he also worked as the Cochise County Hydrologist in Arizona and a forecast hydrologist with the National Weather Service. All right, Rick, can you uh, go ahead and say hi to everyone? Yes, hello, and thank you for attending this webinar. Thank you, Rick. So after the discussion of each topic today, uh, we're gonna stop for a few minutes to answer any questions. You can send questions to the webinar host via the questions function at any time. Please note that there is a questions box on the webinar control panel, which is right under that audio section. So this is where you can type in your questions and they'll be sent to the webinar host who will then forward them to me or even Rick to answer. If your control panel is minimized, uh, please click the view menu and uncheck auto hide the control panel so you can view the entire uh, panel uh, and you're able to submit questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a lot of information to cover. And so before we get into a discussion of uh, the raster based approach to visualizing the time series data, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rick um, so he can discuss the various ways um, that we depict visualizing stream flow data. All right, Rick, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Drew. Again, thanks to everybody for attending this webinar. Yes, we'll be looking at time series using basically temporal maps. Uh, as in all time series analyses, we're looking for patterns and trends. This approach is a little bit different because we're looking at the configuration of data rather than a mathematical analysis of the data. So there's, there's no Fourier. There's no box Jenkins in this talk, so everyone can relax. Um, here's my email down here. If someone has a question after the webinar is over, it's just richard.kaler at outlook.com if you have any questions. So thank you. Well, let's go ahead and get started here. Um, when it comes to environmental data, we have two different types of scales that we worry about, spatial and temporal. And you can see from the graphic here how things change over a spatial and temporal scale. And it's no surprise that nature is dynamic. These patterns occur both across space and time. A lot of times these patterns are tied to scale. So what we need is a way to display multiple scales, especially in the temporal world. 
traditionally, when we look at temporal scales, you would have to have different time scales to look at certain data. So if you have rapidly fluctuating uh, types of events or daily time scale, you'd have a zoomed in kind of a version to see this particular event. If we're looking at seasonal, we would zoom out where we could see more of the data. And long term, the patterns are over years, we would look at maybe the entire record. Uh, but there's challenges with this because it's difficult to do comparisons within and between years when we're looking at a long term. And the irony is the more data that's displayed, the less detail. Just because you have more data doesn't mean that you have more information. Sometimes it actually hinders the ability to understand what we're looking at and what the data is trying to tell us. Different displays that we use for time series, multi-year plots. This is shows the entire record for this one station. And it's only really good for maybe the highs and the lows and the outliers because there's a lot of data here, but there's not much information. Or you might try overlaying several years on top of each other like a spaghetti plot. And certainly we can see that the variability at this part of the record is rather low. Here we've got a large range of variability and down here we don't have much at all. But any individual year is lost in the forest of lines. Or as you can see here, the last example, I shake my head when I see these, but you've got dual Y coordinate axes. You've got multicolored lines. You've got straight lines, solid lines, dashed lines. And this becomes pretty difficult once you start looking at more than just a two or three year period to find out what's going on. We have to be able to do better. Within time series and GIS, two common approaches is this animator slider kind of approach, very sophisticated, lots of different uh, bells and whistles on this. So you can step through the different layers to see changes, but it's, it's a little problematic to look at maybe time five and time two simultaneously since you have these two layers in between. Or as is common, we'll have a line graphs here. I do wanna point out that William Playfair is the person who developed the line graph back in 1786. So basically this is 1700 technology for displaying data. Um, here we have the discharge on the left y-axis. We have precipitation on the right y-axis. And the two lines are overlaid and I'm not sure what this is telling me. It's, it's kind of cluttered. And you're looking at four years of data. Well, let's see what else we can do about this. So I have some data from Colorado River Forecast Center in the uh, Utah area, the water supply forecast. And they have a spaghetti plot here showing the different simulations that were gonna be uh, possible in the future. So it's a classic spaghetti plot. And even though they have the year numbers up here, um, I don't think anyone can find any particular year in all these lines. So the assumption is these are lines in a single plane. That's what I was taught in school. That's what you have when you have a spaghetti, a spaghetti plot. Well, if the current assumption doesn't work for you, change the assumption. I'm telling you, these are not lines in a single plane, although they look like that. What we actually have are multiple our profiles in multiple planes. By taking this alternate view of the same data set, we now reveal a Y axis or another axis here for the year. And instead of looking at the ground, from the ground for this mountain range of data, which is what the Getty plot is, we can take an aerial view and see the patterns much easier from this alternate perspective here. Plus we can use this year day of year axes as our X and our Y values in order to overlay and plot data. For instance, here's the framework that I'm using to make a raster plot. On my Y axis, I have year. On my X axis, I have the day of the year. In any individual day, we look at the values for that day and we'll color code it according to the color scale here. Now we get to see each individual day with equal clarity. Now you may not know anything about this data set that I'm showing you here, but you look at this and you say, wow, 2012 is a lot of red. It's a dry year. Without anything else, you're able to discern that type of a pattern. So this is how 
we view the data. The deal is, the key is, we've got to convert date to an X and a Y. Uh, spreadsheets are great because they assign an integer sequential value to represent a particular date. There's a function on most spreadsheets called year, and you put in the date of the year, and it'll strip out the year. If you want the day of the year, we start with the date, which is an integer, and then subtract out the integer that's generated from the function date. Where in here, I've put in this function here, based in here to get the year, comma one, comma zero, and it returns uh, the day of the year. So here's some examples. And the format doesn't really matter, whatever works for you. The formula is able to take that and understand that. So we take the the date and we subtract out this uh, from the days from the beginning of the year and we get year one and then we do the same for the y coordinate we just take the year of the date it gives us 2019 here april 16th 2019 doesn't matter the format here it is day 106 out of the year 2019 so that's an easy way to take a date and turn it into an x and a y well, let me show you. I've got an example here. Let me pull up my spreadsheet. So I have a spreadsheet for another location on the Colorado River called Glenwood Springs. And I have my date here in D2. And so when I go to the year, I'm simply using the function year with the input as D2 and it gives me 1996. I come over here today, I take the date, which is in D2, and I subtract out date of the year of D2, comma one, comma zero, and it'll give me the day of the year. And you can see as I move up for stepping through this that the year stays the same, but the day of the year changes. Well, let me show you an example here. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to grid some data. I'm gonna pull up that same Glenwood Springs. There we go spreadsheet. I'm going to open it up. And here I have my X. I like labeling my uh, titles on my columns if it's an X, Y, or Z that I'll use. If we view the data, here we go. There's the day, the year, and the flow. I have my X and Y. Now, I don't want to interpolate missing values. It turns out, even though it's counterintuitive, even though a day is missing data, it still has information. And that information is, is that there are no data for that day. By not interpolating and showing the missing data allows me two things. First, it sees if there's a systematic pattern for my missing data. And second of all, it allows me to see when data stopped being collected. So if I'm suspicious of something, I will look at those days before the missing data and see if there's an equipment problem. In order not to interpolate, the gridding method I'll use is nearest neighbor because it's the simplest one provided from all the options that Surfer offers. And I'll just go in here to my search radius. I'll just put in some sort of very small number, 0 0.01 in this case, 0 0.01. And we'll go from there. Now, we've got the X, Y, and the Z. We've reduced the search radius. Now, since I'm looking at daily data, I'm gonna make my spacing every day. And since I want this for every year, I'm going to step through my years at one at a time. And so now I'm all set. I say OK. And my grid file has been created. And that is what we'll use for um, maybe making all the different color contour maps and such. And so here's my content. There we go. There it is, the X, Y, and Z. Here's the search radius to be very small when I do the advanced options. Set my spacing to one, and then I'm good to go. Well, let's look at this and see an actual example of this. I'm going to be looking at the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, Arizona. Here we have an outline of the catchment, and it goes to the headwaters of the Colorado, uh, Wyoming almost into Idaho, and it drains down here to the Lee's Ferry gauge. Just upstream of Lee's Ferry is the Lake Powell Reservoir with the Glen Canyon Dam that came online in the 
early 60s. So this is nice because on this record from the U.S. Geological Survey, I have the flow of the river before the dam, and then I have the flow of the river as regulated releases from the dam, and it's a nice comparison. But there's some patterns here. I see these peaks here, which are snow melt coming off of the Rockies, and I do see some low values here. And then I can see what's going on here uh, from the releases. Now, there's a lot of data in this big, large blue area, but there's discern what's, what kind of patterns you have in here. She use uh, a raster approach. So this is the same data. So let me come down here and let me turn on the raster framework I have here. So here's my plotting area. I'm going to have the day of the year on the X and the year. Then I have some months here at the top. It's really helpful to overlay some of the lines between the months in order to see what's going on here. And I have a overlay for first day of the month. And this is an unusual way to approach this. This is not a grid line. This is a series of um, points that I've overlaid using the classed post mapping option within Surfer. And so these are all the letter I. And you can see I put these on the first day of the month, and you can see what I'm doing for leap year. I just simply jog over the I by one value or one day, which is what's happened. This way, I don't have to manipulate the actual data because I want the data to be sequential. I don't want to add an artificial February 29th. And so now that I have that, it becomes really easy to uh, divide the year exactly into each of the different months. You don't have to worry about, do I use 28 days, 30? What about leap years? This makes it a whole lot simpler. Uh, to handle that. Let me try and get right here. There we go. Now I'm going to overlay the um, the discharge. And what we have here is exactly what I have up here. The data are exactly the same between the two. And then I have my discharge scale. And so I see there's a pattern change around early 60s. Well, this is going from before the dam was in place to releases from the dam. I have a positive Y and a positive X down here, and so I'm always operating in the first quarter, or in the first quadrant. The blue represents the snowmelt coming off the Rockies, and rather than a point, I actually can see when snowmelt begins and when it ends. I can also see there is no blue down here, and that was a drought. There wasn't that much snow on the mountains. So I can see the, uh, the flows. May and June, we have the higher flows. If I look over here, I can see an individual storm. This individual storm was two or three days. But we can see the effects on the river flow uh, lasted for several weeks afterwards. Here's a smaller storm. Here's a double storm here. So we can see all these different patterns uh, quite easily. If you look real close, uh, this is during uh, November. You can see a little bit more orange here in November. Orange would be a little bit higher flow. And what this is, this is a riparian vegetation signal because the trees and the plants along the side of the river in November start losing the leaves. That way the tree reduces its evapotranspiration. It stops pulling water out of the ground and the river can rebound because there's less water being used by the bankside vegetation. Then when the dam came online, we see here a two-day event when they uh, closed the coffer dams and began to fill up Lake Powell. And so we have about a year and a half of very low flows. And then here we have the patterns releasing from the dam. One of the obvious patterns is this blue area in the early 1980s. There was an El Nino in the area, and the snowpack was so heavy on the Rockies, it completely filled Lake Powell. In fact, the Bureau of Reclamation had to put plywood on top of the dam to get another two feet of draft of water behind the dam. And so the river ran high for two or three years um, year round. The other interesting pattern are these, these diagonal lines. And if you look, they happen to be everywhere. Well, those are Sundays. What's going on is Glen Canyon Dam produces electricity. On the weekends, there is a reduction in the demand of electricity because all the offices in Los Angeles and Phoenix are closed. 
less demand, they leave the water in the reservoir, less water goes through the turbines, therefore less water shows up in the river. We also see these artificial floods that are done occasionally. Now, without any statistics, we can do a visual comparison of an artificial flood and an actual flood. And so we see right here, this flood was late March, early April, and lasted for maybe 10 days. These floods would be May, June, last 10 weeks at a different time of year. These are single isolated events. This is a routine, um, regular event here. So a lot of difference between this type of artificial flood and the actual floods. Another kind of fun pattern is over here in late December. And you can see a faint vertical line here. And that's Christmas because of the same reason for Sundays. Now, that Christmas signal is in here, but there's no way you're ever gonna see it with this kind of a plot, but here it is. The other interesting thing that you can see very easily because we've overlaid the first day of the month is how we have a distinct color change from one month to the next. When the dam uh, operators are in a particular month, there's a particular release schedule and it changes on the first day of that month. So we have a very abrupt, almost a um, step function here. Whereas the natural system, you'd have a gradual increase, you would peak, and then you would have a decrease throughout the, uh, the year there. Now, we can do a couple things here in Surfer, which is kind of fun. Let me zoom out just a little bit. And we can overlay a couple different data sets. And what I have here are the releases, but I can overlay on top of this the inflow to Lake Powell. Now, if it weren't for the dam, the inflow to Lake Powell would simply pass by the least ferry gauge. And we turn off the outflow. Now we could see what the river would be if Glen Canyon Dam weren't there. And we can certainly see those high flows from uh, snowmelt between May and June. I can overlay point data on here. So here's um, the annual maximum for uh, without Glen Canyon Dam. And I can actually turn off this. There's the, the, the maximum there. But what is the maximum with the regulation from Glen Canyon Dam? And you can see how much more spread out these high flows for the year uh, can occur. And they can occur at any time of the year. Whereas for the most part, under natural system, those high flows are between May and June. Um, we can also show uh, minimum flows. So I'm going to turn off the flows for um, the inflow to the dam. I'm going to overlay the minimums here. And that's what the, uh, the diagonals are. And you come up here and you can see some very odd things, such as the maximum for the year and the minimum for the year are just a couple days apart, which is a kind of a weird situation. But you can pick up on that. And so having these point data can be very helpful on this. Now we don't have to show the flow. We can show the change in the flow, kind of a DQ, DT kind of a plot. And here I have it blue as an increasing, the bluer, the more rapid the increase. White means there's no change from one day to the other. And the red is a decrease, a falling limb of the, of the river. So I have a, change in flow. So we see before the dam, we have blue as it gets the snow melt, peaks around uh, late May, uh, mid-June, and then it pretty much drops off. And that's the main pattern we see here. But we can see the uh, influence of that power production, how much different it is. In fact, you can see the pattern changes right in 1990. So they've changed how they operate the dam in 1990. So we've got two different uh, populations of data here. If we zoom into that artificial flows, we get this like a little French flag when it rises, peaks, and then drops. But if we look at the flows when there is um, power production, it goes from red to white to blue where it drops, bottoms out, and then rises again, kind of an upside down hydrograph. So all sorts of interesting patterns here. And then on the first day, you can see the red, they're dropping it here, blue, they're uh, increasing the flow there. 
um, just a different way of looking at the data and getting an idea of what, what's going on there. All right. Now, Drew, I have some more slides here, but I thought I would stop and let you see if there's any questions. And I've got three more examples that I'm going to show. All right. Thank you, Rick. Uh, I think it's amazing how using this technique uh, really pinpoints and teases out some of those um, finer or minute patterns that you, you don't see just looking from the, the standard line plots. It's, it's really very, very interesting. All right, so now that we've given uh, everyone some background on the raster-based approach here for visualizing time series data in Surfer, I wanted to open it up so we can field, uh, just like you said, Rick, a, a few questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, uh, please send those in. All right, Rick, I have uh, uh, just a, a few questions for you today. Um, speaking of the uh, different map types, um, I can see in the plot that we're looking at that you have two different uh, map types, a, a class post and then a color relief. Can you comment on why you use the color relief map instead of uh, using a contour map? Well, I'll have an example of a contour map here in a moment, but by having the color relief like this as a raster, it's the same as using an orthorectified aerial photograph. It makes sure that scale is across the board is exactly the same. And it allows me to see details that wouldn't be hidden by anything else. So this is, um, it's like an orthorectified image where I can zoom in and I can see each data point with equal clarity without any kind of uh, interference on that. And um, it, it allows most of the data to be shown in, in a way to where I can find out where there are differences or where I need to focus my attention. The class posts are wonderful because it's a point data. Just like in a GIS, you've got raster. Well, the class posts are point data. And uh, the other nice thing about this graph is I can see things on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual, interannual timescale all at once. So it makes it easy for someone to look at this and get the hydrologic regime kind of in, in one, one image. So you can see what the river is doing. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. Um, I have one more question here. Um, can you quickly explain again why you set the tight bounds when creating the grid? And what would happen if uh, uh, you didn't set the bounds to be a 0 0.01 um, and left it to the default? So I believe this user is asking about the search when you're gridding. Yes, I understand. Well, for one thing, we're talking about temporal data. We're not talking about spatial data. Whereas on a spatial map, I can move in any direction. This is temporal. We can only move in the forward direction. So by setting your search radius large, you could potentially have a storm next year influence your value for this year. Well, that just doesn't happen because that storm hasn't happened yet. Uh, the other thing is by showing where there are missing data, it's a quality control check for me. I can go back in later and certainly estimate that value, but knowing where there are missing data tells me, is there a problem with the data set? Such as if there's an equipment problem, I want to see that week or so before the data started missing. And if there is a systematic pattern of missing data, perhaps you have an algorithm for processing that's a problem as well. You can go, always go in and then estimate later, but initially, I like making sure I want to see where missing data exists. So that's my rationale for that. You may have different reasons for doing that, but um, and by doing such a small value for the search radius, I am ensuring that Surfer won't go ahead and automatically estimate a value in there, and um, it works out fine by setting it very small. It right, makes sense. You keep the data inside the cell by making the search uh, really small. Okay. Yes. Thank yes. you. Very, very straightforward. All right, Rick, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it back over to you so you can discuss uh, your next examples. Yeah, I've got three other examples here. I think you might find these of interest. So here I'm going to be looking at an area, a river here in southeast Arizona. This is where I had worked before called the San Pedro River. And it it's in the, it's in the uh, Sonoran Desert over here, Chihuahuan Desert, no, not the Chihuahuan, but in the desert area in southern Arizona. And it surprises people that 
we do have hurricane remnants come through Arizona, not a lot, but enough to make a difference. And so I was looking at these different storms coming through this area because I wanted to come up with a plot for this small river that's probably the only flowing river between the Colorado and the Rio Grande. And so let me come down here. And here is the San Pedro River. And we put the scale on here. There we go. So what we have here, in the summertime, these are air mass convective thunderstorms that produce intense rainfall, but over a very small area. And you can see that these events don't have a very long uh, tail because they're limited in area. Here are the winter flows for the San Pedro. And I was doing a study looking at winter flows. I wanted to see what the trends are on the winter. And so what I did was, first of all, I can overlay when those hurricanes came on through the area. Like Hurricane Olivia came through here, and you can see the effect of the hurricane remnants lasted for months after that particular storm. Hurricane Juliet, not so much. Uh, Hurricane Heather came through and enhanced the stream flow for a while. So as I'm looking at this, this is important to know, am I looking at groundwater or am I looking at bank storage coming out of the sides back into the river system? And so what I wanted to do is, okay, that's good to know. And I overlay, these are all the class post kinds of options I have with Surfer to overlay uh, particular days. Now, I want to look at this and see what's the trend of the, uh, of the winter base flow here. Uh, let me zoom out just a little bit here. There we go. And so I'm going to turn off the landfalling hurricanes. I'm going to put in a five CFS contour. Here are the contours. When is the flow five CFS or less? And that would be within the contour. So we have points, now we have lines, and now we have areas. And I can see some interesting patterns just from this already. Um, for this five CFS contour in the summertime, I can see that where normally five CFS would be occurring at the end of May, we can now see that it's occurring towards the beginning of May. Here, the five CFS in October, now it might have made it to the first of November occasionally, now we see that it's actually reaching into mid-December. And that's 5 CFS, but if I'm looking at the winter time here, uh, the January, February period, it's pretty much always having 5 CFS throughout the entire record. Well, that's not 5 CFS, let's look at 10 CFS. Ah, we see that the area encloses a little bit different. Certainly there's large areas earlier in the record where we have that, a couple of droughts here in the 50s and the 80s show up, and then we have these a little bit more discontinuous areas here afterwards. That's with 10 CFS. What's interesting is that if I look at just the 15 CFS, now this is broken up much more. What's interesting in the later years, there's Olivia right there. The only reason since about 1990 that the wintertime flow would reach 15 CFS is only if you have a storm come through the system, whereas before, the regional aquifer would have provided enough water to the base flow to have this occur, and the flows would have lasted for um, over a period of several years uh, during that winter time. But we can see in more recent years, that's not the case at all. So by judicious use of contours, we can see the winter base flow pattern of this particular location. Here's another different example. This is an oceanography example. Um, looking at red tide studies. This is like a, a habitat study looking at multi-layers. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Moore, who's a oceanographer, a research oceanographer for NOAA, wanted to look at all of these environmental conditions at Puget Sound and find the conditions that would enhance a red tide bloom. These are dinoflagellates, specifically Alexandrium, that uh, bloom, and when they bloom, you don't eat clams or any kind of shellfish because there are toxins in there. And so what I've done here is I've lined up all of these different time series which are occur occurring at one location and just like a GIS. Then I can show you the scales for each of these. And then 
the thresholds based on Dr. Moore's research, when the day, data are within these different thresholds, it enhances the environment that you could have an, a, a bloom of these um, organisms that cause the uh, toxin issues with that. So I have gone through here, I've identified the thresholds based on our research. By identifying those days and just summing up, doing a binary, uh, if it's within one, if it's outside zero, and just summing up all of these, basically I've come up with a summary. And here's the summary for all the days where all eight conditions fall within those thresholds. And usually, this is an August, September kind of an event. When I showed this to Dr. Moore, she became very interested in this uh, May set of conditions because uh, this tells you that the Alexandrium could be um, a viable bloom as early as May instead of being more of a late summer event. So this is a nice way to summarize a whole lot of data and give decision makers kind of a snapshot of what's going on. And finally, one more example here. Uh, this is tides for a place up in Alaska called Cook, or um, not Cook Inlet, Hawk Inlet. And we can see traditional tides. This is one day. This is one minute tide data. Here we're looking at a week for over 10,000 data points. We start to look at one month and it gets to be kind of hard to see the patterns here. And then after three months, it, it's very difficult to see what's going on. But if we use a raster approach, here's what we get. We get for an entire, whoops, an entire year, starting with January going into December. And we can see this. Now, let me go ahead and quickly turn off these two lines. And you see that sloping line there. That sloping line changes 24 hours every 29 days. That's the time period for full moon to full moon or new moon to new moon. We're seeing the influence of the moon on this. Then I can overlay another layer, the sunrise and the sunset. And there's an offset here because we're going on to daylight savings time and coming off of daylight savings time. And immediately we see how those lower flows or those lower tides are associated with the sun. So we can see the influence of the moon and of the sun. And we're looking at over a half a million one minute data interval data points for the entire year. Yet we're able to tease out the effects of the moon and the sun, show sunrise and sunset, which would be pretty difficult for an entire year if I'm just showing you three months here and it is uh, pretty crowded there. All right, and um, that's all I had. I, are there any other questions? All right, thank, thank you, Rick, for those detailed explanations. Um, and I think we all benefited uh, from seeing how you put this together. So um, undoubtedly your expl uh, explanations here have spurred a few questions from the audience. So. Uh, before we close things down, let's go ahead and cover those. So the first question, Rick, is, is this limited to um, hydrology type data or you can use other data types? And I think you showed a, a few other examples right there at the end, but um, can you go ahead and comment on that, Rick? Oh, I've used this to look at traffic flow in an urban setting. I've looked at people attending a recreation center, seeing how the day pass versus the annual pass numbers vary. I've looked at fish, salmon, uh, migrating up the Columbia River. I've looked at the entire Columbia River temperature um, all at once to see multiple reservoirs to see how their temperatures are changing. Um, any, any time series can be used for this, absolutely. I'm a hydrologist, so I'm drawn to the hydrology, but as you saw with the uh, red tide study, it could be any kind of a uh, of a signal. Um, I've used looking at drought signals as well. So yeah, any time series or generated time series. It doesn't have to be observed. It could be something as part of a modeling. You have a particular management scheme that produces some results. You could compare that output from a model from another output that was generated under a different management scheme. Okay, thank you. Uh, excellent explanation. Uh, and I have one last question about the red tide uh, example. Is there any way you can click back there? All right, thank you. Um, so the question is, um, could you use grid math um, to create this summary raster? And so 
Um, I'm actually going to field that uh, question myself. Um, great question. Thank you very much. Um, each layer needs to be uh, reclassified, which you can do um, using grid math. So you have a binary situation, uh, either on or off. And then all of those uh, different layers that you're seeing in the layer stack there could be added together um, to find out what the actual uh, to get that resulting summary summary slide. So yes, this is a, a, a real basic form of raster modeling where everything's turned into a binary situation uh, and then the results are shown in the summary slide. Could um, not have said it better myself. All right, all right, Rick. Um, I have a, actually have a couple more questions that have just came in. So if, if you don't mind. No, that's fine. Um, and I, I'm not sure if, if if you can answer this one or not, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you take a whack at it. Okay. Um, the, the question is, can the raster-based approach be added or adapted for irregular time series data? For example, a mix of month, uh, month and daily data. Um, yes, absolutely you can. Um, I've done that very thing. Um, I can take uh, a layer and like the, um, the drought layer, and basically what I do then is for that monthly value, I would assign each day within that month, that monthly value, then I can overlay it on top of the uh, other daily data. So yeah, there's no problem with mixing layers as long as the X and the Y framework is the same between the two. I just take the monthly and, and turn it into a, uh, a daily and then there's no problem with that at all. I've done that, it works out quite nice. All right. thank you. Um, a next question, instead of temporal data, do you think you could apply these techniques to bivariate situations? Um, so let's say instead of uh, time uh, or discharge versus time, it could be discharge versus rainfall. Um, yes, absolutely. I did water quality, irregular data. I was looking at the X axis was water temperature the y-axis was pH, the acidity of the water, and then I created a heat map for the dissolved oxygen. But then I put in each of the data points and when they occurred, winter, spring, summer, or fall, and that turned out to be an extremely useful way of this kind of um, other kinds of uh, axes data that you can use. Yeah, and Surfer handles it all without any problems whatsoever. So yes, absolutely, you can do that. I've done that as well. All right, it looks like we have one more question, Rick. Okay. Um, and this this is kind of looks like a follow-up to uh, the question from uh, the first time we took a pause. Um, when using nearest neighbor for the gridding method, is there a general rule when you define that search range? So it seems like people have some interest on how you define that search, why, how you determine that search rate uh, yeah. radius. Basically, what I'm doing when I have my data from the time series, I have the value I want to assign to a node. So I'm trying to match up that data to a grid node. And that's where I'm coming from. By assigning it to a grid node, then I know that it will plot up correctly. What I want to make sure is, is that I don't start interpolating um, and keeping those grid nodes that have no data to show that there's no data on that. Uh, let me show you real quick here. Let me go back to my example when I first started. If I zoom in here, at the end of the day, at the end of the year, what I have is a series of missing values. Well, these are day 366 for those days for non-leap years. And then here it goes through for leap year. If I really wanted to fill this in, I could use the January 1st of the next year and uh, dual purpose it on here to fill these in. But I wanted to make sure that I am having clean breaks on this and I can see why there are missing data at a particular point. It, it's valuable for me to see that. Once I discover that, you can go back and estimate that if you want. But I wanted to make sure Surfer doesn't automatically go out and search and calculate something. I just want them to be blank, hence the very small number, much smaller than the data interval that keeps it as missing, and that's what I was wanting to do. All right, thank you, Rick. And um, can you go ahead and click back to your email address slide there so we can uh, let the guests see 
uh, how to contact you. And I have a, not another question, but I have a comment. Uh, I had a user that has applied this technique uh, to one of his data sets real quickly while you were talking. And from what he can <laughs> tell, the resulting plot looks amazing. So seeing trends that he didn't see before. He says, thank you for the great webinar. And I just wanted to pass that on to you, Rick. Well, and, my pleasure. Um, yep. And so this concludes uh, our presentation of the data visualization and analysis of time series data using Zerfer. Hopefully everyone found the information we covered today useful. I know uh, I definitely learned a lot today. So if you have any additional questions on what was covered today or anything else Zerfer related, uh, now that we're concluding the webinar, please feel free to call our technical support line or also email questions to support at goldensoftware.com. Uh, now, if you have any questions about Rick uh, or for Rick specifically, um, his email address, you saw that a little bit ago, it was richard.kaler at outlook.com. Please feel free to send them your questions. And again, a recording of the webinar is gonna be posted uh, on our website. And as always, Thank you very much for your time.